welcome to Church Alive. We are so glad that you're able to join us today. If you'd like more information on us as a church, how to give, and our available resources, then make sure you head over to our website. I hope that you enjoy today's message. Welcome to church. So good to see you guys. Please stay standing. I'm going to pray for us in a minute. And uh, I just want to say to the guys, come on, guys, get booking, get booking. Uh, Pastor Andre is one of a few great speakers who will be here on the 11th of June for our Legends Men's Conference. Everybody good? Are you glad you came to church this morning? All right, come, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence here. Thank you for the incredible opportunity, privilege to worship you this morning. And Lord, you are in this place. You are in this place. As we give you our hearts and our minds, will you come and speak to us, Holy Spirit? We need your word. We need your revelation. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. You may take your seats. Good morning to our family watching online. So good to see you with us as well. And if I can encourage you, uh, at the end of this service, we are going to take communion together. So uh, if you can ready yourself at home or wherever you are to take some communion with us, a little bit later, that would be awesome. All right, everybody good? You guys look amazing. Um, so now, uh, yes, 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 he, he, he told us that he uh, proposed to the girl, but I'm sure there are some people here who's going, who's the girl, yeah. right? Where's the girl? Where, where's, 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 where's the girl? Where's the girl, eh? Is she outside somewhere? Is she at growth track? All right, well, you guys, you guys can go and congratulate Jenny. Jenny Zibani, oh, are you, are you a proud mommy right now? <laughs> mommy sitting in the front here. <clears throat> Another one out the house soon, eh? You're gonna have pocket money one of these days. <laughs> Auntie Anna. <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. And then of course, now, you know, you're at Church Alive, we, uh, we make a fuss of, of your, your marriage. The minute you are married for 20 years, we make a fuss of you, and every five years after that, and uh, we give you a voucher so you can go and uh, go and enjoy a meal together because we believe in marriage. Come on. And we believe in the value of marriage. We need to encourage. How many of you need encouragement? Come on. We all need some encouragement. So we encourage each other here at Church Alive. Now, this is a very unique one. This is a 25th, it's 25, eh? 25th wedding anniversary, I think it is. Um, but that happened during COVID, and uh, so we didn't have a chance to celebrate it. So they're actually celebrating 27 years of marriage. Where's Ken and Heather? Ken and Heather Staples, where are you? Right in the back there. Congratulations! <clears throat> it is 25 years, right? Yes, 25 years. Well done. You guys are an inspiration. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, come on, come on. We need to, the Word of God says we need to give honor where honor is due. Are you ready for God's Word? Yeah. We're in the middle of our series, Kingdom People, Kingdom Purpose. Kingdom People, Kingdom Purpose. How many of you have been encouraged by the series so far? Um, and I hope that you've not just been encouraged, but actually you've... Uh, You've come to a place where you've started to take steps forward in a different direction and um, in line with God's will for your life. Today I'm going to talk to you about being on the move. How many of you know that God's purposes and God's blessings are discovered on the move? A lot of things happen on the move, doesn't it? Uh, we discover things on the move. We heal on the move. Come on. We heal on the move. We, uh, we make connections on the move. We grow on the move. Anything that stagnates, and that includes your life and my life, does not grow. It does not, it does not gain momentum. We need to be on the move constantly. And I want to show you today from God's Word that when we pursue God's blessings and God's purpose for our lives, it has to be done on the move. Uh, this week in your life groups, as you watch the next session in the series, Your Time Is Now, uh, you'll be looking at the life of Abraham. Uh, here's the thing about Abraham. 
In Genesis chapter 12, God says to Abraham, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing. And that's a great reminder for us as well. God's blessing upon our lives is not for the sake of our happiness. But the purpose of the infilling is always the overflow. The purpose of the infilling is always the overflow. It's how we impact the lives of others around us. For Abraham, it was an incredible blessing. The, the blessing that God would pour out upon Abraham's life and his family and his lineage would eventually become the blessing of salvation that you and I enjoy today, thousands of years later. Incredible blessing. But this is what Abraham discovered in that moment, that the first step towards stepping into that blessing and into that purpose that God has for his life was to go. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, God says to Abraham, you need to go. He says, God, I accept the purpose you have for my life. What's my first step? God says, you need to move. You need to move. And let me tell you this. It sounds very incredible. It sounds uh, adventurous. But Abraham had to move from his father's house for the first time in his life. It wasn't easy. More than that, like Yesh said this morning, God would not tell him where to move to. He said, I need you to, to talk to yourself and get it into your heart that you are ready to move. You need to move by faith. And as you move by faith, I will show you where you need to go. It was not an easy step for him, but it was a necessary step in order for him to discover the extent and the outrolling of God's blessings upon his life, but especially the purpose that God had for him and his family. Are you with me so far? The key to unlocking the blessing is movement. Abraham had to go. He had to leave a place of comfortable norms. Let me ask you a question. If you believe that you still need to discover God's purpose for your life, and you're ready to pursue that, how comfortable are you where you are right now? Because if you and I truly want to hear the answer to that question, what is my purpose? The answer might not have anything to do with the purpose itself initially, but are you ready to move? Are you ready to move from a place of comfort? Are you ready to move from a place of indifference? Are you ready to move from a place of unforgiveness, of bitterness? Are you prepared to let go of the past in order to step into what God has for your future? This is an important principle. We discover God's purpose and blessings on the move. We discover God's purpose and blessings on the move. And the question about our comfort in a certain place is a very important one because People, I've seen this, I've discovered this in my own life, people who um, settle for too long usually struggle to take their next steps. Let me give you a very good example. People will come to church Sunday after Sunday because they love the place, they love the, the worship, they, they love the messages, whatever, the coffee, whatever but they never move to a next step of becoming involved, becoming a member, going to growth track, finding out what it means to be a part of the family. And the longer you are a guest, and while you're a guest in our house, you'll always be a welcome guest, but the longer you stay a guest, the more difficult it becomes to become a family member. Discovering our purpose requires a process of constant movement in the right direction. To give us an example of this from Scripture, I'm going to take you to another one of my favorite Bible characters. His name was David. Anybody remember David? Let's, let's take a peek into the life of David for a moment. Here's the thing. David's purpose was to lead a nation. His purpose was to become a king. But there was a season in his life when, he, when that was an outrageous proposal. David did something that was completely contrary to the purpose that God had for his life. In fact, his reality 
was that he did the most menial of jobs, the most look down upon work at the time of David's life. And that was to look after sheep. David was a shepherd. To be a shepherd was the lowliest of all jobs that you could do. The thing about David as well is that he, he could not even boast that those sheep were his. He looked after somebody else's sheep. When you study <clears throat> his life a little bit deeper, you discover things, and I, I've, I've started to ask questions about his life that the Bible is not clear about. <clears throat> Why is he so isolated from his family? You always find David, he's never part of the family. He's always out there in the field. He's always isolated, separated. What is that about? I believe David actually lived a life of rejection. I don't know why. I've got a few hypotheses as to why he lived that kind of life and why Jesse didn't want him around, his dad. But that was David's reality. And yet God's purpose for his life was for him to lead a nation. How many of you know <laughs> that there's a lot of movement that's going to need to take place here? There's a lot of movement that needs to take place here. So, to get where God wanted him to be, he needed to start moving. Now, this is what happens. All his life, David wakes up every morning. He goes and looks after the sheep faithfully every single day. Remember some time ago, I think it might have even been last week, we spoke about how we go through the valley so that God can change our character. Remember that? God changes our character to prepare us for our purpose. And so this is what David's reality is. He's in a place now. He's in a, he's in a valley in his life. He's despised. He's rejected. He, he does the most menial of work. But he does it faithfully every single day. And I think this is, this is why later on in his life, he wrote a psalm that went something like this. He said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. David understood that every season in his life has a beginning and an end. You see, the thing about the valley, David understood this. The valley is never there to camp in. The valley is there so we can move through it. You move through the valley. Valley is where your character is built. Valley is where God challenges you to overcome some things, to let go of some things. And we stay in the valley until God says, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. You'll get to the end, but there's some important lessons you need to learn. There's some transformations that need to take place inside you because the purpose of the valley is to get you to the place where you can begin to climb the mountaintop of your purpose again. That was where David was. And then one day, God says to Samuel, the prophet, I need you to go and anoint the new king of Israel. He doesn't know it yet, but he's one of the sons in, a, in Jesse's household. So Samuel packs his stuff. He gets to Jesse's household. And David is in the field looking after the sheep like he, like he always does every single day. The rest of the family, however, they're in the house. And Jesse brings all his boys. Oh, good-looking boys. They've got so much potential. They're they, they educated. They, they're part of Saul's army, and he brings them in front. He goes, this must be the one. Oh, my boys. And, he, he just, and Samuel stands back and says, it's not one of these. It's not one of these. They've got all the talent. They've got all the swag. They've got everything it takes. But there's something that's missing. Something had missing. So we pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 16 from verse 11. Then Samuel asked, are these all the boys you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse replied. But he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Can you see in those words, Jesse going, please don't worry about him. You know, we, we all showered. We've got our cologne on. He stinks. Look at this. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. In order to discover your purpose, you need to move from isolation to reconnection. Let me, let, let me explain to you what this means. This is a weird part of Scripture for me. 
Because whenever, I find a pattern in Scripture, whenever God reveals His purpose to human beings, He usually goes and meets them where they're at. You pick that up in Scripture? He meets them where they're at. He, he, uh, he meets Moses where he's at. He goes to him in the wilderness. He meets with him and he talks to him through a burning bush. He meets with Abraham where he's at in his father's house. That's his place of comfort. He goes to him there. He met with Mary where she was at when he told her that you will give birth to a son. But this one is weird. This is what God says. Tell David he needs to come from where he is he needs to come home. He needs to come home. He needs to come into the family. And I am, you see, these are, these are moments that the Bible does not speak about. But I can ima imagine whoever it was that went to go find David out in the field with the sheep, say to him, there's a prophet here, he says you must come home. I can imagine David going, Really? Are you sure about that? Because my family doesn't like me being home. It is the, the place where I am despised. It is the place where I am rejected. It is the place that has hurt me. It is the place that I have history with and it's not good history. And God says to David, I know you hurt. I know you're feeling rejected. I know you're feeling despised. I know people have said stuff to you and you were treated in a wrong way and you've carried that burden for a long time, but the only way you will discover your purpose is if you have the courage to come home again. Because home is where your purpose is. Home is where the Word of God is waiting for you. The, the Word is not going to come to you where you are in the field. No, you need to come home because that is where the Word of God is waiting for you. I hope that the revelation is dropping for somebody. You need to come home. I'm just going to say it like that. I, 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 don't, I don't need to explain it to those who need to hear it. You need to come home. You need to come home. And maybe home is a place that's hurt you. And you're discouraged, but you need to come home. Because this is where the Word of God will give you your next step into your purpose and the blessings God has for your life. I'm talking to people who <laughs> come just, you know, when, you know, it's not comfortable to be part of the family always. You have to wash dishes <laughs> and vacuum the carpets. <laughs> come on. It's easier just to be a guest. Come on. To engage from a distance. But I believe there's a real call in our generation. I believe, in fact, that the next move of God's spirit in our generation is a call back to commun community. To draw people out of isolation and back into community. David. You've been isolated for too long. It's time for you to come home. It's time for you to heal. It's time for you to reconnect, to reconcile. Come on. It's time for you to forgive. It's time for you to get over the past because that's where the word of God is for you. Is somebody encouraged today? There's power and synergy in community. There's only so much we can do on our own. David, before you can become the king of a nation, you need to first reconnect with your family. We discover God's purpose and blessing on the move. Let's look at the second movement required to discover our purpose and God's blessings for our lives. Now, this is the amazing thing. <laughs> When you go read the story, you find David eventually gets home and the, and the prophet is there and he says, this is it. This is the new king of Israel. And he takes out this flask of oil which was very symbolic 
and a very necessary part of the anointing. And he pours this oil over David's head. And I, can, can you imagine that moment? I mean, I, I live myself into, when I read the Bible, I live myself into those spaces. One of the things that I always ask myself, if I were in David's shoes, and I perhaps had the kind of history he had with his family, how would I respond in that moment? Let me, let, let me tell you what I would, as that, as that prophet pours the oil over my head, I would be looking at my brother and say, what's up? And I would do it so, so the oil just flicks on them like, what's up? You want a taste of this? Who's the boss now? Next thing I would do is go get one of them, go fetch me a horse. And I would be driving off to the palace to let the king know that there's a new interior designer coming tomorrow. Because there's a new king in town. Come on. You know what David does? I mean, this is what the valley does. This is what the isolation sometimes does. Remember we spoke about that. God will put us into... I, it transforms something in us. You know what the Bible says David does? I suppose even in... It's still surreal experience of unbelief. He walks out of that house. He goes back to the sheep. <laughs> because he has a responsibility. Life was not about getting to the top for David. It was something about his character. He said, I have a responsibility. I'm, I'm going to try to process this whole king thing, but I have a responsibility. Yeah. Incredible character. And, the, and he, I can imagine for days, he's still looking after the sheep and he's wondering, so when is it actually going to happen? Have you ever been in that place? Yeah, it's been public and everybody knows it and you know it, that you know you're the, 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 the door of your ministry or your opportunity has come, but you haven't stepped through it yet and you're going, God... Uh, this is starting to look embarrassing. <laughs> we we there right now as, as a church. We know we're going to plant a campus of Church Alive this year in October. Come on. But you know what? We, we're just seeing the next rung of the ladder. And God says, just take that step. Come on. No, 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 please. Where, it's like, yes, shit. Where's the money going to come from? Who's our plant team going to be? Come on, where's the leaders going to be? Will the people come? Uh, we, we're still in a place of trying to negotiate to find a space. And we're going, God, the time, the date is drawing closer. God says, relax, I've got this. You just keep serving. Just keep giving. Just keep giving yourself to that, to the place where you are right now. Don't worry about it. I'll take you there in right time. Just allow yourself to be given in worship, in surrender, in service, day after day. When the time is right, the door will open and you will step through it. Come on. Then one day, 1 Samuel chapter 17. I love the way this passage starts. One day. Come on, your one day is coming. Your one day's coming. Come on, it's a word for somebody. Your one day's coming. It's just around the corner. One day, Jesse said to David, take this basket of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. They're on the battlefield. And give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army at the Valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. So look at this, incredible character. You know, <laughs> again, if it was me, I'm going, yes, I'm free of the sheep. I'm on the stage now. So David left the sheep with another shepherd. Wow. It's not even his sheep. He left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the gifts as Jesse had directed him. Here's the second move, the second step. We need to move from forced duty to responsible service. 
Let me, let me unpack that for you a little bit. We need to move from forced duty to responsible service. Let me ask you a question. Do you move in life because you are forced to by a sense of duty or because you are motivated by a vision? Do you get up every single morning because your boss said so? Because your mother said so? Do you move in life in a spiritual realm because the Bible says so? You go, whoa, Pastor Jay, what's wrong with that? Nothing. But you know what? When you stay in that place of just doing what you're doing because the Bible says so, you live, begin to live a legalistic life with no passion in your heart. We need to begin to move from a place where we go, I'm not doing this because the Bible says so. I'm not doing this because Pastor Jay says so or because I'm on, uh, my name is on a roster somewhere where I need to serve. No, I can't wait. I'm not asking, why do I have to do this? I'm asking, why do I get to do this? It's a mind shift, but it's an incredible movement that needed to take place in David's life. And it's a movement for some of us. The reason why we're stuck is because God says, you're still living a life of duty. You're still living a life of legalism. But you've lost the passion. You need to get the passion back. Those were not David's sheep, but he loved them. He made sure that now he's got a breakthrough and he's stepping up into a higher space. He was still concerned for those sheep. He would not abandon them. Why do you get up in the morning? Why do you give? Why do you sacrifice? Why do you serve? Why do you worship? See, moving into a place of responsible service requires a shift in our thinking. But if we want to see the blessing and discover our purpose, we need to move. If you want to see, experience a blessing of peace, you need to move from the comfort of your anger to the discomfort of responsive and responsible forgiveness. Remember when you were younger, and especially if you, like me, uh, grew up in a house with five kids? (laughs) I had this often. If parents go, say sorry. Come on, how many of you know that? Say sorry. It's okay when you're kids. I've seen 30, 40, 50 year olds. You still have to tell them, say sorry. (laughs) And then you know what happens, right? It's like, sorry. There's a whole lot of legalism and and you've got the obedience box ticked right there, but there's no heart. There's no heart. You see, people who have no heart behind their forgiveness do and say all the right things, but they're still chained to the hurt of their past. (laughs) This is important because to discover your purpose ahead You need to leave your history behind. If you want the blessing of a healthy marriage, you have to move from the comfort of single adulthood. Come on, Yeshua. (laughs) To listen here, to the discomfort of responsible shared choices. I love one of the one of the topics that Mo and Pindi is going to talk about is shared goals. Come on. You're married now. It's not my money and your money. Uh Uh-uh. That's how you spoke when you were single. My money, my this, my dreams, my this, my wants, my space, my car. Okay, you can still have your man cave, but that's it, all right? (laughs) No, 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 no. It's not my money. It's our money now. Come on. It's our house. It's our bedding. Come on, guys, just let her have the pillows. Just let her have the, the scatter cushions. It's fine. No. Just go through it every morning. Just put them back there. So. Corner. Yeah. Yeah. Just do it. Just do it. It's worth it. Just do it. You'll be happy. <laughs> you 
If you want to leave a legacy of a healthy marriage, you need to move from the comfort of justified self-righteousness to the discomfort of humility, confession, and selfless acts of love. You now run her bath first before you go empty the geezer to shower. Somebody needs to say amen. Amen. If you want the blessing of gain knowledge, you want to acquire knowledge and life experience, you need to get off your blessed assurance. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's not going to come to you. You need to get off the couch. Hello, somebody? You need to get off the couch. You need to move towards taking your next steps, responsible steps. You've got to get up. You've got to sign up. You've got to pitch up. And then you've got to sit up. And then you've got to shut up. (laughs) Ask yourself a question. Am I yet to learn or to show the world how clever I am? If you want to achieve something, you need to move from the comfort of entitlement, come on, to the discomfort of responsible hard work and the cultivation of a generous spirit. There's only one way to break a spirit of entitlement. You need to start being generous. And by the way, if you want your staff to be better, you need to climb off your high horse first and you take the first steps in bettering yourself. Your staff will follow what they see you doing. And by the way, for parents, on on that note, children don't respond to what they hear parents say. They're watching. They're watching for the movement. They want to see where you're going, what moves you are taking in life, in love, and in morality. Movement, what gets them moving. We discover God's purpose and blessings on the move. Somebody say amen. amen. Here's a third movement. David gets to the, bit, the, the battlefield where his brothers are, and he's appalled. There's this giant standing in the middle of the battleground, blaspheming God's name and, and mocking God's children day after day, and the mighty nation of Israel, the mighty army of Israel under Saul, who's this I don't know, six, seven foot guy. He stands head and shoulder above any of his soldiers. Sits in his tent, trembling. David doesn't get this. I've discovered in life that the greatest thing to move you forward is ignorance. <laughs> I've seen the most ignorant people become the most successful people in life. And when people ask them, how did that happen? They said, well, nobody told me that you can't do that. So I just did it. (laughs) So watch this. 1 Samuel 17, 26. David asked, who is this pagan Philistine anyway? And why is he allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Don't worry about this Philistine, David told told Saul, that's the king. I'll go fight him. Look at this. You need to move from self-preservation to other-mindedness. And again, uh, let let, let, let me just give you a glimpse in the the behind-the-scenes imagination of Pastor Jay. I'm going, if that was me, oh my word. I would go there. Look at you. I'm prepared to help you, but I just need you to know something. You never had the confidence to conscript me into this army in the first place. You thought I was a runt. I just want you to know that. You thought I was the runt. I'm not here with my brothers because you didn't think I was a good enough soldier. Now you want my help. 
That's after the prophet came and told you and showed you that I'm the next king. I'm still not here. But there was something in the valley. There was something in the field that changed David's character, that transformed him from the self-preservation mentality and always needing to be acknowledged. Well, I'll do that if you acknowledge that you hurt me. Who are you? Who am I? David said, in this moment, I'm needed. Whether the people here hate me or love me, it's irrelevant. But in this moment, I'm needed. And life is not about me and my rights. Life is about this moment that needs me. This moment needs my talents. I've been practicing how to do this sling thing for many, many years. Self-preservation to other-mindedness. David understood that his bitterness or his indifference to the world around him will eventually come back to bite him. See, we don't do what we do in our generation for us. We do it for our children and our grandchildren. And that day, a nation, a family, a clan, a tribe of which he was a part of and of which his children has a legacy in, needed to be rescued and he needed to get over himself and the fact that he was despised by those people sounds a lot like somebody who died on a cross for you and me because I'm needed right now God's purpose and blessings are discovered on the move in order to make a difference, David needed to lay down his indifference. So let's take a moment and recap those three moves, those three points. We need to move from isolation to reconnection. Come on. Come home. Come home. Secondly, we need to move from forced duty to responsible service. Allow your place in God's family to become a joy, not just a duty. And number three, we need to move from self-preservation to other-mindedness. In a moment, I'm going to show you how Jesus himself had to st make, step through all three of those moves in order to bring you and I salvation. Every single one of them, he had to take. He had to move through those to bring us salvation. So let's read this passage of Scripture together. Philippians 2, verse 5 to 11. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling on. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, and he moved from divine glory, he moved in with mankind. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died, <coughs> excuse me, died a criminal's death on a cross. You know what, there's a, there's a passage in Scripture that says this. It's in Hebrews. Because of the joy that was set before him. <laughs> you know what that joy was? He saw you and me worshiping God in a church in Northliff on the 22nd of May, 2022. And he said, I will do anything. I will give anything. You don't have to force me to do this. I give myself willingly so I can see that vision fulfilled. Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Before we take communion together this morning, won't you just bow your heads for a moment?
in this moment of quiet, as we allow the Spirit of God to speak to each one of us. Are you stagnant? Are you stuck right now? What is the Spirit of God saying to you? Just pray a simple prayer. Say, Lord, what is my next step? What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Perhaps you need to move today from a place of self-sufficiency, being your own God, your own provider, the creator of your own legacy, to a place of surrender. We acknowledge your creator as Lord and Savior. You go on your knees and you bow before him and say, Lord, from this day forward, you will be king and savior and God of my life. If that is your next step, your next move, then right there where you are in your seat at home, pray this prayer with me in your heart. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the love that you had for me that moved you from to leave the glories of heaven behind so you can become one of us to be with me. Thank you, Lord, that you died on a cruel cross to save me from my sin, to deliver me, to pay the ransom required for my freedom. Thank you that you rose from the dead on the third day to give me eternal life. Today, Lord, I receive the gift of salvation bought with your own blood. And I choose to call you my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me my sins. Cleanse me from my unrighteousness. Fill me with your spirit and teach me and empower me every day to keep moving closer to you, closer to your purpose for my life. Change me, transform me. I thank you for your love and your forgiveness. Amen. When you came in today, all of you would have received one of these. If you have not got one of these and you would like one, please raise your hand nice and high. Thank you. There's some, somebody in the front here, somebody over there, some people on this side. Hospitality. Just keep your hand up nice and high until somebody brings you some communion. Great. Everybody online, so good to be with you today. And uh, we're going to take communion together. You can peel back the first part, just the first layer, just take out the wafer. This is symbolic of the, the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for us when he died on the cross. And when we eat this bread together, we are not only reminded that he laid down his life for our sake, but we are also reminded that the end result of that is not only our salvation as individuals, but our unity as a family. So as we eat the bread together, we remember Jesus and his body sacrificed for us. We also remember each other. We remember our love for one another. The same blood that runs through all our veins, that connects us, that unites us. We remember the church of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus for your body that was broken for us. We remember you today. Amen.
as we drink the cup together, we remember that a great price was paid for our salvation, a price we could never afford to pay. We remember that through the blood of Jesus, we were led into a new covenant relationship with our Heavenly Father, one that has no restrictions. We can go straight into His presence, and, we, and He can be our dad, and we can be His children. And whenever we feel the old nature coming back, we can come to Him and we can ask for forgiveness, and He will forgive us because of the blood of His Son. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blood on the cross. Amen. Holy Spirit, I ask today that the Word of God will sink deep into our hearts. It will take root and bear fruit. It will transform us and change us that it will pour out of us, not in a legalistic way, but it will allow us to show more of Jesus to the world around us. You are worthy of all our praise. Empower us this week, Holy Spirit, every day after that, to live, to walk, to talk, like citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Children, of the family of God. We love you and we worship you. Amen. I hope that you were encouraged by that powerful message. If you'd like to take your next step, head over to our website where you'll be able to fill in a response card. If you'd like more information on our resources, upcoming events and programs,